testing the chat and the sound. So if you can hear my voice, go ahead and put something in the chat saying, I can hear you. I just tried, I just did it from my phone, but just make sure that the loop is closed and I can carry on. Also, I apologize for the sound of my computer's fan. It's trying its hardest. Maybe I'll, ooh, maybe I'll move it into a quieter area for next time. See if I can get it away from the microphone.
All right, we're just under a minute to start. If there's anybody watching this right now that can hear what I'm saying, will you just put, I can hear you in the chat? I do this every time. I don't trust my setup. Strangely, it's worked okay, but for whatever reason, I don't trust it every time. I just don't want to get talking for you know, 40 minutes and then all of a sudden realize that no one can hear me. Have to start the whole thing over. There it is on my phone. Lindsay can hear me. Good. It is 10 on the dot. I'm going to go for it. All right. Welcome to class this morning, y'all. Um, let's just kick right off. This week, so last week we did the light shapes on black paper. Uh, normally I'd ask everybody how that went and whether they hated it or not, but uh, the results are usually similar. You know, a lot of people found it, find it uh, disorienting and difficult, and yet really quite like the results. Uh, that's where I land. Some people like it a lot. They thought it was really fun. Uh, the idea, the whole idea behind that is just to get you looking away from what we usually look at, which is just the dark marks, the lines, the shadows and look at, look at light as a thing of its own. Um, because at the end of the day, the reason you see anything is because of the light that's bouncing off of it. And uh, if you're drawing, uh, at least uh, representationally, realistically, if you're trying to convince us of, of the world and the things that you're drawing, you're using the way light behaves as your basis for the decisions you make in the drawing. And so understanding how light behaves is critical if you want to turn that understanding into communicating to someone, viewer, uh, the vision that you have or what you want them to see or how you want them to experience what you're drawing. Or if you just want it, in fact, to look like things look in the real world because light behaves consistently. And if you're consistent in your drawing, then you mimic that effect uh, sometimes quite effectively. So. I want to kick off today. Today we're doing something just a little bit different. I'm not going to draw from the model today. Uh, today's going to be like that first light shapes lecture, but I'm going to do it live. Um, we're just going to talk about light and shadow. We'll probably, we'll see how much time there is. I'll probably do a sphere drawing, sort of a draw along with me sphere with no reference, just using what we learned today. And then tomorrow we will draw from the figure. Uh, you'll still have two drawings that you can choose from. I'll put two references in the assignment, but we'll only have one live demonstration of that drawing uh, starting tomorrow. Now's a good time as any to mention as well, and I think I'll send out an announcement to this effect, but you're gonna need to get your gray paper. If you haven't gotten gray paper, um, you don't technically, I don't wanna say this, but you don't technically need the gray paper. You can do what we're gonna do on the white paper. It's just harder, it doesn't work as well. So if you don't have gray paper, get some, get a pad of it. You can buy a 24 sheet pad of gray paper. I think it's like 18 bucks, which may be prohibitively expensive at this point for some. Um, if you have, if you have the ability, I would get some. I know that Allard's, I think, is doing curbside pickup, so you could call in or even go online to Allard's and order a couple of sheets. You probably need about, uh, the materials list says six sheets, but we lost a week, so at least, so you'll four sheets should, should easily do it for you. Um, although you might take to gray paper really well and want to get more sheets than that, so I'll leave that up to you. But just know gray paper is coming. It's it's not going to be next week. Next week we're going to do anatomy intensive stuff. But the week after that we're going to start into doing covering sort of what we covered today just with different materials and on different papers. So today is kind of the last piece of the puzzle as far as putting an entire uh, drawing together, lighting effects and all. So that's kind of exciting. You won't have me throwing new stuff at you, I guess after this. So let's kick off. I want to start this off with this 
situation. So um, if I were to ask, and I usually do in class, I have this up. If I were to ask you which of those squares, A or B, is darker than the other, um, it's going to reveal to us what's going to be happening to us in the drawing as we go. It's going to be happening really quite badly, I would say. It's, we're very given to this particular uh, problem. And if you were to ask me, I know this trick, and this is a trick. I know this trick, and if you were to ask me, just looking at this image, which one is lighter and which one is darker, I would say A is a darker square, B is a lighter square. A is, it's just, that's just the way it looks. Um, let me show you what the reality is. So if I grab B and bring it to A, you'll see not only are they the same square, but the letters are the same as well. So the letter A and the letter B are the same value. For some reason, A, the square seems darker, and A, the letter seems darker than B. And that's no trick. If I take A and bring it down to B, same story, right? This A seems lighter than that A, but it's the same. I pulled it down. There's no gradient effect on here. Feel free to analyze my Photoshop layers. There's no other trick than what your brain is doing to you. And that trick is the context of what is around these squares is causing you to read them in a particular way. Everything from the pattern on the check checkerboard to the size of this cylinder and the fact that it's lighter here and darker there, this gradated, sh what we're reading as a shadow. Your brain is sort of keyed to contextualize what it's seeing. And so the context is the only thing that's changing what's happening here. A is going from being surrounded by these lighter squares through this gradient area to where it's being surrounded by these darker squares. And as a result, it looks like it lightens up. Right? That's just a trick, a trick of the brain. If I were to take part of B and just scale it up, you can see that if I make that bridge, it's the same value. And when I say value, I mean light and dark. That's the same square. The only thing that's different is the name of the letter, A versus B. All right, so that's how much of a liar your brain is to you about what you are seeing. And I'm gonna bring us back around to this in a minute, but what I want us to do first is get some terminology. Uh, inside of Canvas, you will see a link to what I'm about to bring up, which is this, this handout. It's light logic, or as the Italians called it back in the day when it first started being played with, chiaroscuro, which just means light and shadow. But there are names for what is happening in the light and names for what is happening in the shadow, and I want to make sure that we're familiar with these names. Uh, you should know these by the, like the back of your hand. Uh, you should be able to identify them. You should be able to ask yourself as you're drawing, particularly as you're rendering, what am I see what am, what am I rendering right now? What is this area right now based on the terminology we're about to go over? You should always be able to answer that question. So, and I'll I'll we'll point that out in specifics here in a minute. But first off, let's go through All right. Let's go through this terminology. So, in the light side, there's really only th three things that we need to worry about in the light side. The first one is the center light. And that's just the side of the object. And I'm just, forgive me, I'm going to flip down back and forth. Well, let's do all three of these and then we'll go look at them. So center light, it directly faces the light source. So wherever the light is coming from, that side of the object that's facing that is the center light. As opposed to the halftone, which is where the object maybe isn't facing the light anymore. It's starting to turn itself into shadow. It's, it's kind of facing sideways to the light source, but it's still catching a little bit of light, right? And then there's highlight, which is the shiny spots. It's the reflection. If you have a glossy object or even kind of a slightly shiny object, you'll see more of these. If it's a matte object, like a really dull or like a hairy object or something like that, you won't see any at all. 
um, highlight. It's just the reflection of the light source back to the viewer. All right. And I would encourage you, there's also a link to a video, much higher production value than I can do. It's about seven minutes long that goes through these things. Really, it really does a great job. So I would encourage you to click through that link and go watch that video as well. So if I come down here to our image, this right side is our light considerations. Center light is this whole side of the egg that's facing the light source off to the right. Half tone is this area of the egg right here that's still catching light, but isn't really facing the light. It's starting to darken. It's starting to get this smooth darkening effect happening, but it hasn't yet moved into the shadow side. All right, and then the highlight, the shiny spot. And if you watch that video, and it's something I always bring up as well, if you watch that video about light and shadow, the highlight is because it's a reflection like if you imagine yourself in the reflection of the mirror you move and your reflection moves right you as you move around that reflection moves around as well the highlight does the same thing more or less that means if you stand up like if you move to where you're well above the egg that highlight will move up and follow you if you move down, it will move down. That highlight kind of moves around. And you can see that really well in that video that we cover. I think it uses this same egg image. I believe that's where I pulled this image from uh, to discuss these things. And that's really important to remember because the highlight is something that we chase. We sort of go after it like, oh, I want that highlight. But it's kind of not the most important thing. It's really good for showing volume right, for showing three dimensionality, it makes things pop. But you kind of don't want to go after it too soon. Because if you spend your whole drawing, working around this highlight you already put in, you're going to have problems, it's going to make it harder. All right. So those are really the only things that we're thinking about in the light. And by far and away, what I would say the most important part of the light, the most descriptive part of the light as far as the object itself is this halftone. That halftone tells us what that object is like. If this transition, this halftone dark area is smooth, then we know that that object is round and smooth. If it's harsh, like a really abrupt turn, we know it's a sharp object, like a box wouldn't have this smooth area of halftone. Its area of halftone might go down to just a sliver of nothing as it goes from a fully light side to a fully dark side really fast. And everything in between. So the smoother and longer this halftone is, the wider the form seems to be. The shorter and thinner this halftone is, the, the rounder, the quicker, sort of the smaller and rounder that object or that form will appear. All right, so that's the light. That's relatively easy. The shadow gets a little bit more complicated and I just want to note that the shadow is broken apart here into form shadow and cast shadow. So form shadow, and we'll, I'll just talk about those briefly. Form shadow is any part of the shadow that's on the form. So if I hold my hand out in the room I'm in right now, the side of my hand that's in the light is one side, but the form shadow is the part of my hand that is facing away from the light. That's opposed to a cast shadow. So let's look down here in the egg. The form shadow is all of this shadow side of the egg. It's the shadow that's on the form. Cast shadow is this shadow that appears to be being cast onto this surface by the egg. Right? It still has to do with the egg, but it's being cast by the egg onto the surface that it's sitting on. And cast shadow, it's kind of a... I mean, it, it makes sense to think of it as something being cast by the object onto nearby objects, surfaces, or whatever, but that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is the object is blocking light from hitting the surrounding area. So it's really a, it's less the object throwing a shadow, and it's more the object blocking any light that's going to hit that spot with its own self. So that's splitting hairs, I guess, but that's a better way to think of light. I like to think of light as kind of like a, it's like a shower and there are, there's streams of water or photons or light sort of emanating and coming and hitting things. And you can, 
You can block that and that creates a shadow. Anything that's not getting water hitting it is shadow. Anything that something is blocking the water from hitting is also shadow. One being form shadow, the other being cast shadow. Um, and then you can sort of think of light as bathing objects, just like striking objects. All right, so let's talk about the form shadow. There's a couple of things in the form shadow to think about. One is the core shadow, and the other is the reflected light. Core shadow is the darkest part of the shadow, right? And reflected light is a light, slightly lighter part of the shadow. So let's look down here. This dark strip through here, that's core shadow. Back here's where the label hits, but it's all the way along this area, core shadow. And then reflected light is this lightening area down here. Things seem to lighten back up, right? And it's because reflected light is exactly what it sounds like. Light is hitting the table, bouncing and coming back into the object. It's really important to note the difference between reflected light and actual light. Reflected light is light that has come down, hit a surface, and bounced in to another surface. It's bouncing from a nearby area. And one thing about physics is there's loss of energy when things bounce like that. Thanks, Benjamin. So bouncing back into object into the object like that, it loses energy. And so it's not going to be as light down here as it is up here, no matter what your brain is telling you, no matter what it looks like, right? All right, so because of that, what that means is that the light is never going to be as light in value. It's never gonna be as close to white in this reflected light area, in this shadow, as it is out in the actual object, right? The actual object here, even in the halftone, is getting light that's hitting it directly. If it's bouncing in here, it's gonna lessen in value. And we're gonna look at that here in just a minute. You'll be able to see the difference between those two. All right, so that leaves reflected light, or that leaves cast shadow to talk about. Oops. And there's really only a couple of things to talk about with cast shadow. Um, and that's kind of how it behaves, like different parts of it. The darkest part of a cast shadow, you can see it with this egg right up underneath here. You get this dark, super, it's like where the light, the light can no longer bounce effectively up into that small gap there. And so as a result, it gets darker. There's more ambient light or light from the room hitting it over here. And so it's kind of slightly lighter in value. So that's how cast shadow behaves. It gets darker as it gets closer to the object casting it. Not only that, but the edge gets sharper the closer it is to the object casting it. So maybe back here, definitely down here, this edge, if you look at it, it's less blurry than this one back here. This one back here, it kind of blows out. It's got a longer period where it darkens and blurs. And that's just because of how far away the object is from the shadow that it's casting. And what the way I like to um, think about it is like if you look at a chain link fence, like I go pick my daughter up from school or I used to at least, uh, I go pick my daughter up from school and I, I can stand there in the sunshine and look at a chain link fence and that part of the fence that's down at the bottom, close to the ground, the chain link, the wires of the chain link are really quite clear. And if I look at the shadow of that chain link fence where the top of the chain links would be, 
it gets even blurrier. It tends to blur out and lighten and get a lot less clear. And that's because that, that part of the fence is farther away from the ground. So the farther an object gets from the shadow it's casting, the blurrier the edge of that shadow is. And you can capitalize on that and we'll probably look at that tomorrow. Um, you can really play with that in a drawing to highlight the feel of the light source. All right, so let's go back. Well, let's we'll see that down here. Some examples of these things in some in figure drawings. So highlight might be a shiny spot out here on the shoulder. Half tone there behind the arm, but also all along this edge. While it's still in the light, that's all half tone. And right after half tone, right after it goes into shadow, you get this darkening, this dark core shadow that's right next to the half tone all the way up. And this artist has kind of played up this, this core shadow, darkened it quite a bit to show off the three dimensionality of the, of the form that they're drawing. And you can see it makes it, it makes it kind of pop. It gives it some quite a lot more roundness before we get into this reflected light where presumably light is bouncing off this nearby object and back in. Okay, back to this. Let's take a look then at this sphere. Now I'm just going to pull parts of this sphere out so that we can see what they're like. So I'm going to pull them into this white area so we can see how they behave uh, when they're not in the context here. And remember, we saw from that uh, example, that optical illusion, we saw how this influenced, the context influenced the way our brain perceived what we're seeing. And it's happening here too in this sphere. Right, so let's take a look. So I'm going to pull the highlight. Let's say I'm going to do my best to see where it's at. Let's see. The shiny spot, we'll call it right there. All right, I'm going to pull this. All right, so there's one thing we already can see is that that highlight is not as light as pure, pure white, right? Pure white I have right here as my background. But if I come over here, the lightest part of this thing I thought was that shiny spot. Maybe the table down here. Let me grab some of that. Maybe this is it. Okay, nope, that's about the same. Maybe it's a tad lighter. Maybe over here you might say, maybe that's the lightest. All right, so you see my highlight area, everything that I pulled from, that was the lightest stuff I could see. This first square was my actual, where it looked like my actual highlight. Then I pulled from the table and a little bit of the, just the lightest spots. And you can see it's not pure white. That doesn't mean you can't use pure white for those things. But what it means is that everything else in this image is darker than that. All right. So, well, let's pull something from the light then and see what it's like. So we're just not the highlight, but maybe like next to it over here. going to grab a couple of samples. Oh, that's even darker still. So I pulled that one from right underneath where that highlight is. Still in the light. All right, well, let's go. I'm going to go half tone at this point. My goodness, that half tone looks dark. Grab another sample. Remember, this, is, this part is still in the light. Uh, 
Okay, so somewhere between my light and my half tone, like my light goes from this light to that dark in the half tone across this little gap here. All right, and I'm gonna now I'm gonna skip one and grab something that that commonly becomes a problem, and it's this right here. I'm gonna skip the core shadow and I'm gonna grab the reflected light because one of the biggest things that I see when people are drawing light and shadow, rendering light and shadow, is this reflected light looks light. It looks really light. And so oftentimes people will go, you know, well, you know what? That's the same value as the half tone out here. It's the same value as the light, is this reflected light. So they make it the same value in the drawing. If I grab this and pull it over here and grab another sample from here. The very best we can do is that it's the same as this half tone. And what I would say is if you are drawing Let there be a division, a separation right there. So your half tone, these are kind of in a similar ballpark, except for that I put those in the wrong spot. Let me grab these. Reflected light. These are in a similar ballpark, but it's nowhere near, like you can see, oops, you can see the light is so much lighter. That's just right out here so much lighter than this in here. This is about the same as this right here. And if I grab some core shadow, you can see how much darker the core shadow is. And let's just finish it off with some cast shadow. A cast shadow looks like jet black to me. All right, so this is kind of the structure of the light as we go across something like a sphere, is you have your, your highlights and your lights, which, are, which can often be quite close together, your halftone, which starts to darken, but is still catching a little bit of light, into core shadow, which is darker by quite a lot, back to reflected light, which may get as light as the halftone, but my advice to you would be to don't let it, like let there be a separation between your light, so halftone is still part of the light, and your shadow, which is this reflected light. Don't let your reflected light get as light. Keep it just a little bit darker than your halftone at the very maximum. That will help the value structure of your drawing make sense. So your light side will all feel like light, your shadow side will all feel like shadow, right? It's almost like your, your middle ground here See if I can build something real quick. So it's this is almost like the structure that you get. So in underneath this black line, all of this stuff is where your shadows live. Right, and then up above, that's where your lights live. And you don't need to cross back and forth over that line, right? Your shadows, everything in, no matter how light it seems, everything in the shadow is darker than anything that's happening out in the light. And if you keep that structure alive, if you keep that going, then your drawing will have much more structure, much more volume. Uh, it's a great place to start. Now this is, yes, you can break this rule, particularly when you start using color, you can get away with quite a lot. But for now, for beginning, for starting to render, for starting to think about light and shadow, this is a good structure to, uh, to keep in mind. Right? Make sure that you're uh, you can name these different parts of light and shadow and you can describe sort of where they exist on this scale from dark to light. Bearing in mind that the lightest thing in the shadow, this reflected light, is still darker than the darkest thing in the light, this halftone. Right? 
at best for now, they'd get close. All right, so with that in mind, and I would do this, what we're gonna do next, um, let's shut this, save on my computer, save on the desktop. Um, I'm not going to have you turn this in, but I would probably, I would do it if I were you. All right. Cool. Uh, I'm going to just go through in vine charcoal. So I'm going to use vine charcoal and a kneaded eraser. And I'm just going to draw a sphere using the principles we just talked about, using the terminology, terminology we just talked about. Uh, there's that PDF, the one I just showed you with the terms and stuff on it. That's in the assignment. So if you click through to that, you will see it. Uh, you can download it um, and refer to it until you know it like the back of your hand. There's also, as I mentioned earlier, there's a link to that video. Um, that sort of goes through that same that same uh, terminology in a really nicely produced way. Right? It's not as it's not as slapped together as what we're doing here. All right, so and I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of take the page up and I'm gonna spend the rest of the time today. We'll see if we run the whole the whole time, but. So I'm just going to lay a sphere down. That's just from the shoulder with this vine charcoal, just kind of giving myself that spherical framework. Maybe I would consider that my gesture. I'm going to give myself some fake top of a table. All right, and I'm going to decide like which, where's my light coming from? Oh, y'all might have noticed I'm flipped today. I was told in the intermediate class that if there's chat at all, it kind of goes up the left side if you're on a phone. And so if I have my drawing over on the left side, then it gets hidden by the chat stuff as it comes up. So I moved it over. You can let me know if you feel like that's necessary or not. All right, so let's say, I, I already have kind of a lighter edge here. I'm going to have my light coming this direction. So that's going to be my light source. That means, so here's something worth noting. If my light source was right where this triangle was, the shadow that it would throw would be enormous, right? Because it would be my light source here. It'd be tangent to that edge means it's just just touching it or if it's a lot farther away let's say it's like sunlight or something then it's going to be a lot more those rays come in a lot more parallel all right so what does my shadow look like maybe i want to move this up just a little bit like that so i get the whole the whole shadow on the page and a shadow of a sphere. It's just the shape of that sphere laying on a table, which happens if you've taken beginning from me, then that's an ellipse. It doesn't have to be super clear right now. We can clear that up later. So that's telling me already where my light source is. It's kind of like triangulating me back to some distant light source. All right. With this kind of a shadow, my light's kind of coming from straight up above. If it was behind the object, then this, it would kind of blob out this way. Right. If it was in front of the object, it would blob out backwards. It'd go back. This flat one here, kind of like light from straight above, maybe slightly off to the left, 
or t- for your right, slightly off to the side and and more or less straight above. Which means my shadow edge, and you'll see this is kind of a mirror of what we're doing in class as well. Hey, Margie. Uh, in class, we do a gesture drawing. We work through the structure. We find the shadow edge. We fill the shadow in with value. Um, that's what I'm going to do in this sphere as well. It just hap- so happens I'm drawing something much easier than a full figure. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do this, and you'll see me do this tomorrow. Because I'm on white paper, I'm going to gesture in. Pretend I'm doing a gesture session real quick. I'm going to do that gesture smear a few times. I was happy with the sphere I had. I'm just doing this to sort of mimic what I might do in a gesture session. Let's say maybe there was something there before. Just getting some activity on the page, just getting something happening on the page. All right, so now I'll bring that sphere back. You can see I really didn't lose it when I did that. It just kind of... If I call it ghosting, it just kind of ghosted. Hey, is anybody watching this on a laptop? Just throw in the chat if you're on a laptop watching. All right, and then back to my, let's see, here and there. So I'm taking my cues from where my light source is hitting. So somewhere up there is my light source. It's hitting the object here and creating that part of the shadow and hitting it here and creating this part of the shadow. I'm taking my cues from that to decide where my the edge of my shadow is going to be. Right. And it's a round, it's a sphere, so I'm making this object, this uh, half tone round, a little bit round. All right, so there's my shadow edge. All right, Lindsay, I'm going to do something real quick. No, Margie, you can watch it on your smart TV. Lindsay, I just made you a moderator. So if we get another troll in, you're in charge of kicking them out. Can you do that for me? Just let me know. I think I can add as many moderators as I like. Okay, so I've got my shadow edge. I'm gonna fill my shadows in with one pass of value. I might grab a smaller chunk of vine charcoal just to get this job done quicker. Lindsay. Right, and I'm going to take this opportunity to say I'm going to do all my dark stuff. So I've got quite a lot of empty space down here. I don't really care because I'm just doing a sphere exercise. I can just leave that blank. But it's also it's a good opportunity to add like the front of a table or something. Maybe I want to move it up a little bit. That'll add some space. That'll add a sense of space out the front.
what I'm shooting for here is to make my lines. I want my lines to become borders instead of lines for this drawing. Because I'm showing off light and shadow, I want it to kind of rhyme with the way we see things in real life. And we don't, when you see a ball or something, when you see things in real life, you don't see lines everywhere unless there are really thin shadows or really thin textures or something like that. Um, instead, you see edges, you see borders. So the edge of this ball is going to be made up of the silhouette of it against the background and the silhouette of it against the foreground or middle ground. Um, and it's just that change from light to shadow that makes it show up. So I'm going to keep that in mind as I'm working. Eliminating lines is going to be part of my, my goal as I go forward. All right, right now I'm just going to smooth this vine charcoal. This is the nice thing about vine is it gives you these smooth halftones really fast. kind of get rid of this texture in the front as well because I really don't want that to rob attention. I'm kind of treating this like a full drawing but it's bearing in mind that it's just an exercise and there's no reference for this it's just drawing a circle and playing with those light and shadow effects on the circle and I would encourage you to do this I really would encourage you to do this because it'll make you feel it'll make you feel powerful If you can draw a sphere just from your mind, right, paying and practice it, maybe your first one doesn't go exactly the way you wanted it to, or maybe it's got some weirdnesses or whatever. Um, but drawing a sphere just from your mind, using the light and shadow principles and giving yourself the freedom to do it is your first step on, on exerting your understanding of light and shadow on a drawing which is different than doing what you think you know when you don't. It's doing what you know you know when you do, <laughs> if that makes, this, makes sense at all. When you know what light and shadow does, when you know how it behaves, you can look at a drawing or you can look at life and say, oh, I see what's going on here, or I know how to best, I can punch that up a little bit. Like I can add some core shadow there and really show off the roundness of that thing. Even though I don't necessarily see it, I can do that in the drawing and it will show, thing, it'll show up better. But you have to be willing to deviate. You have to be willing to step out a little bit from copying the photo or doing exact. That's where life drawing is better, I think. You get that information better in life than you do from a photo. A photo can often just tell you, no, shade it like this because this is because the photo can't lie. But the, the photo does a really good job of mimicking what our eyes do, but it's not perfect. And you can really make it happen in a drawing more effectively. I'm going to grab some silhouette with that background. So you can see the kind of clarity that I, you can get. I'll avoid blowing charcoal dust all over my computer. That edge, because I came back with a hard mark and sharpened that edge, it has just gotten really crisp here in a way that it's not anywhere else. That's the kind of clarity you can get. You don't need a line when you have a border like that. That's gonna do all the communicating you need and I'm gonna ease it just a little bit actually. Yeah, just to give a little more atmosphere, just easing that edge. You'll see me use my fingers a lot when I'm working with vine charcoal. It's fine. Uh, or even when I'm working with charcoal pencils. But there's a way to build things up much more cleanly. That's what we've been doing up till now. Things are about to start getting kind of messy for us as we work with these values, but it's gonna make us quicker. Taming that mess allows you to do a full value drawing in a couple of hours, where if we were using the pencil and sort of swiping in all that value really carefully and really cleanly, you might've noticed in the, in the black paper drawing, it can take some time just being real careful and real soft to build up those values. But if you do that, you end up with a remarkably sensitive drawing. The drawings we're gonna do are a little bit uh, rougher. They can still be quite smooth and, and 
nice as well, but the sensitivity you get from a sharp pencil over many, many, many hours uh, is beautiful. I can show you some examples of that. Um, for time's sake, we're gonna manipulate value and work with light and shadow in a quicker fashion with vine charcoal, with the stick mediums, maybe some pencil. I'll probably do the first drawing that we do as a combination of pencil, compressed charcoal, and vine charcoal, just to kind of bring it all together. All right, and that's gonna to be tomorrow. Feel free in the chat as well if you have specific questions or if you have questions about stuff that's maybe not necessarily related to this drawing, you're welcome to ask them in the chat. I'm also going to be doing the Zoom meeting right after this using that same Zoom number if you click in Canvas on the open Zoom session, using that same number, uh, I'll have a Zoom session open for also to take questions or to discuss anything that's Anything that you didn't get to in the chat that maybe I didn't speak to while we were drawing. Or if you just want to ask privately, you can private chat me during that Zoom and get a response. I'll just private chat you back. All right, I'm going to darken this light. I've got enough charcoal on my hands that if I do this a little bit, it's going to be darkening that light side. I'm just going to kind of work some of that mess away to see if Again, I'm kind of trying to get rid of the lines that I had there at the start. And that's not bad. It's like equal parts me drawing and me blowing on my drawing, it seems like. All right, I'm gonna bring core shadow back. I am gonna throw a line down here just to Describe where that edge is. But as soon as I do that, I'm going to turn that line. I call it growing the line. I'm going to grow that line into a shape. All right, so now the line that I made has kind of disappeared in favor of this dark shape that I'm making instead. just a little bit. So I've got my vine charcoal on its side and I'm kind of doing these little circular motions with it just to fill, fill the area in. All right, and I made this line, that's definitely gonna be something that I have to chase away because it's right now it's too, it's too much. If I imagine this ball was a mirror, I can ask myself, like, what would I see in a mirrored ball? And I, if you've ever looked at a mirrored ball, then it might be uh, easier for you to be able to tell that than if you've never looked at a mirrored ball. But what I could, what I can imagine it doing is this light area here. If this ball were a mirror, this would be the table around sort of like a bent version of this table. This dark strip would be like a bent version of the surrounding dark of the room. And this area up here would be like a bent version of the ceiling and the, the darkness of the ceiling with the light source and other stuff that's happening up here. But because it's not a mirror, what would normally be dark reflections of the light source and everything here turns into this bath of light. And it's everything, everything gets really generic. The lightest stuff is here. The dark room is here, less of the room light. I mean, the room is potentially, presumably darker than the immediate area. So it darkens through here. And then it lightens back up again for this table. That's essentially the same thing as what's happening. Just in a reflective ball, everything is sharp, crisp, and it's the clear image. 
in a regular ball, everything is diff diffuse and non-reflective, and so it's just a lot more generic. But I'm gonna, my fingers have become a great smudging tool because they're full of charcoal, so if you have a smudging tool, you can use it, uh, but be careful because they can be really addictive. And they can cause everything to get this kind of blurry, smudgy look. You don't blur indiscriminately, you blur for a reason. So here I wanted to soften that halftone edge. Now it's like this, this is doing what uh, I was saying before, what your brain wants to lie to you and say, this is really light. And so I've got this quite light, but as I darken this core shadow, it's actually too light. So I'm going to darken it, but I'm not going to darken it quite as much as that core shadow. And I'm going to use my charcoal pencil here, or my vine charcoal, to soften, to do what I just did with my fingers in the other side. Soften that edge. Put a little bit more there. Soften that edge. Yeah, I feel better about that. I've got a bit of a, my vine charcoal is okay for this. I think it's just not quite as soft as I'd like it to be. But still working. And I would encourage you to do this as well with your other materials. That you're using. So when we move to Conte, particularly Conte on white paper is tough. Maybe I'll speak to that. Conte works way better on the gray paper because the white Conte is just not very strong. It, it can't it can't go on top of black Conte or dark Conte and be really strong unless you spray fix or something ahead of time. It tends to mix in quite a lot. But drawing these spheres with those other materials before you use them for reels is a good is a good idea to get you used to them. In kind of a, I like to think of this as a low risk environment, just drawing a sphere. All right, so I'm going to come in and get this occlusion shadow, and I'm going to remember from my image that the. The cast shadow is the darkest. Of all the ones that I pulled off to the side and looked at, the cast shadow is definitely the darkest. That can change. If this ball was black and the tablecloth was white, then the cast shadow wouldn't be as dark as the core shadow of the ball, for instance. But given that all of this is supposed to be white, um, and that's where I would start drawing your spheres with the assumption that everything is the same sort of white or everything's the same value. The same color, so to speak. It's like a white ball on a white tablecloth or something. So that you don't, so you can get used to things. But it's like, I could imagine this ball having a stripe through it. Like maybe it had a black stripe that came all the way through the ball. Then what would I do? Would not ruin all of my work. Not really, no. As long as your shifts are the same, as long as your shifts still make sense, it's gonna work fine. So if I pulled a black stripe through here, it would be way darker than the light out here, but it wouldn't be full black yet. It would go full black right here in this core shadow, way darker than the white core shadow, and then it would lighten up maybe slightly again down in the, in the reflected light. And as long as the black stripe made those transitions the same as the white ball is doing, it'll look like a black stripe on a white ball. If I just go black the whole way, we might still believe it, especially if I put some roundness to it. We might still believe it, but it, would, it wouldn't be as effective as if I followed the transitions that are happening uh, on the ball itself. Light, darkest, lightening up again, darkest still. All right, I'm going to play with this cast shadow. It's already doing it a little bit. I'm just going to encourage it to do it a little bit more, which is that it's sharper here where it's closer to the object. Get rid of this line. Uh, 
So like that trip is a short trip. This trip is a longer trip. So I'm going to encourage it to blur out on this end. I'm going to use my, so I use my finger to sort of transition it to the white and then I used my stick to bring some more charcoal back in because I felt like I took a little too much away. All right, I'm gonna dress up some of that. I'm gonna get rid of some of this, these charcoal marks. Just to give my, I like to give myself a little peek around the ball right there. Right. And so far I haven't done anything in the light. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Um, I've kind of built the, so the halftone, I've got this darker area coming through here of halftone. I've got what I'm going to call direct light already on the ball from where I did all of that smearing to begin with. So the nice thing about that, the nice thing about starting with the drawing and then smear, draw, then smear and so on, is that my page is loaded with charcoal right there. And then I just carried on the drawing as if it was just white paper still. I just carried on drawing the rest of the stuff. So now I can come back and all I have to do is add the highlight. And the nice thing about the highlight is because it moves around, it's a reflection of the light source, it doesn't have to be perfectly perfect. There's no spot here that it has to be. It could be over here. It could, there's a little wiggle room on where I put it and it'll still look fine. Right? In a way that I can't with this halftone. If this halftone arced some different way or was like off from the shadow, it would look strange. Um, particularly when you're working on a figure. If you make this halftone, if this isn't descriptive, and that's why when we did the shadow shapes and the light shapes, really, you really have to pay attention to that light shadow edge and the angles and like the what's actually happening because it describes the musculature and the masses and the forms of the body. You really want that to be as clear and accurate and descriptive as you can because it will show us the structure much better. The shiny stuff, that's just icing. Like it doesn't, it's not as uh, foundationally important. Though it does give things, does give it pop. So I'm going to say right here, and here's what I like to do this. I'll roll my kneaded eraser into kind of a cone shape and just kind of push it for a big spot like that maybe even bigger. And I kind of, I've overshot here, but I'm gonna chase it back a little bit. You can see it's still there. It's just kinda, of, I just kinda of chased it back. Then I'm gonna bring the kneaded eraser again, pop out again, chase it back a little bit. So that I get this kind of slow build up to the highlight. I don't just wanna put a highlight in like this, Boom, highlight. If I do that, it's going to seem disjointed with the rest of what's going on in this ball. If the ball was really reflective, the highlight might be crisp and clear like that, but so would everything else be, right? The table would be clear. Everything else would be very clear. Because of how diffuse and soft everything appears, my highlight kind of needs to build up, needs to be a little bit Oh, did my voice just cut out? Hmm. Let me check because my stuff's still showing that I'm all right. Oh, did my voice just cut out? Did my voice cut out for anybody else? Because when I pull it up on mine, I'm okay. Margie, is it your internet?
Lindsay or Araceli, let's see. Yeah, Lindsay Araceli, do you want to weigh in? Did you hear me? Do you still hear me? Did I cut out for you at all? Margie, I just pulled it up on my phone and I was still okay. So we'll see if the other, I'm gonna keep carrying on. Uh, we'll see if the others also, my the volume cut out. I guess you can't hear me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna come through and darken if I can. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to darken this core shadow a little bit more because I want this thing to pop just a little bit more. Okay, looks like Lindsay and Araceli can still hear me. Margie, it must be yours. Sorry about that. You can come back and watch this after the fact as well. One thing to note about these marks that I'm making is they I'm kind of imagining the ball as I make them. So if I were wrapping a string or an ant or something, I'd be going this way with it. maybe to straight, to arc this way with it over here. It's a small thing, but it can really help describe the surface to sort of imagine yourself going along the surface. I'm going to break this little line up a little bit. Rather than just shading all the way across like this in these big long strokes, coming back and going this way almost towards the light source is really helpful. being a little bit more careful with these marks than I was before. I'm gonna ease this as well. So at this point I could come through, I've noticed that my ball is kind of wobbly as it goes around. That's not gonna, that doesn't really hurt my feelings any. Now would be the time that I would come through, maybe this other stick. And just clean some of that up. Smooth that line out just a little bit. It doesn't bother me that it's getting lost over here. I've got enough context to show that ball off, that little edge getting lost. That maybe that's happening in real life, that's fine.
I think I'm going to play this light shape up just a little bit stronger on the edge here. At this point, I'm just kind of playing with the light shadow effects, right? Like what's, what could I imagine happening here? back and shave that background in just a little bit more. So I'm going to take my smearing pinky and I don't want to compete with my highlight. Even though in the reference image I saw this edge being just really quite light and the highlight being about the same, I'm going to prioritize the highlight value wise. Just let it be my lightest thing. This edge is turning away from me anyway, so I'm just going to let it do that. All right, there is one thing I want to talk about with the cast shadow as well. I'm like, do I like all of those thin marks? One thing to remember with the cast shadow is that it's a good opportunity to describe the objects around the form you're drawing rather than describing the form itself. Let me explain what I mean by that. Right now, the cast shadow, it's, it's, it's telling me, hey, this ball is on a flat table with nothing on it. No texture, no anything, just a flat old table. But in the event there is anything on that table, maybe a fold of fabric or something, anything. This cast shadow is a good opportunity to show that. So I'm gonna do that in a couple of places just to sort of show you what, uh, what a cast shadow can do. Actually, I'm gonna go the other way with that. So I'm just making a dark smudge this way and this way. and maybe one this way. All right, so those were just to give me a sort of guidepost to go from. Now I'm going to pretend that these are wrinkles in some fabric or something that's coming past this ball. So what's gonna happen? Well, this wrinkle fabric is coming along just fine and then pops up. and pops up. So I'm gonna to add to one side of that and subtract from the other. Let me make that just a little bit tighter. Get rid of the line here. And I could even ask myself more questions like, what would this, what would this little wrinkle be like? Well, if there's a side of this that's facing, like which side is facing what? So the right side of this fold is facing in to the shadow of the object, so it's not gonna be catching too much light, though the shadow might be a little bit darker, this side of it but it's probably catching some ambient light here, like the reflected light, maybe just not as strong, maybe just from the side a little bit. So, and rather than erasing that or lightening back up, I'm just gonna darken what's around it. It'll achieve the same effect of giving this sort of a little bit of character. And Oh, 
I'm going to darken this little area so that I can erase back out some light. I didn't like how sharp that was seemed to be undercutting, so I'm going to smooth this out just a little bit. There we go. I have a little bit of a line right here, so I'm going to try and get rid of that line. I just want a border. All right, so what's going to be happening on this fold is the light's going to be striking the table straight on and straight on. So that's where the table is flat. The table's flat again over here. And back here. And then the top of this wrinkle is probably going to be catching light. And maybe there's I'm not going to get too hung up on that. That's just to give me some edge to whatever that, whatever this thing might be. All right, and then same same story over here. Two bumps there. Just top of one, top of the other. And the space between them. And to the side. Because this is presumably fabric or something, these don't have to be super matchy match, one side to the other. They just need to kind of mimic each other, do, do a similar thing. All right, this is further away from the object, so I'm gonna let the edge be a little bit blurrier. Except for maybe right here, I do want that silhouette to kind of show what's going on. Maybe there's the other side of that, which would cause this to drop. All right, and I'll come back with the eraser and make that clearer. All right, same story as before. Light's coming like this, so it's probably going to be hitting this thing right there and right there and hitting the ground. Flat spot, another flat spot. All right, now I'm going to clean up this edge here. Let's get rid of that. This is going to show a little drop off. So it's going to come to there and T. That angle is important right there. It gives us the drop. I can make that crisp if I want. Because presumably it's the edge right as it drops off. If I match that over here, so here I pushed the shadow up, here I'm going to push it up as well. By the same amount even. And let's take a little bit of that arc off of that.
right? So now that cast shadow is describing, I really haven't done much. And in fact, I could probably get rid of a lot of this, like this line and this stuff, and even some of this stuff. If I just have that shape of the cast shadow there, it's still going to look like there's something going on in the surface. Right? I can get rid of most of this. You can imagine this being like if you were standing outside around a bunch of rocks or something and casting a shadow and looking at them, your shadow would kind of be dancing up around on top of all of those rocks and giving a lot of cues as to what that surface is doing. And in a sphere like this, we can just kind of make it up. You can invent it. But on a body, if you have one part of the form here, like the arm, and another part there casting a shadow, and I have a bunch of lights in here, but you can kind of see my cast shadow on this arm, it's like wrapping like that. If I use that to my advantage, just pay attention to that and go, okay, there's some wrap there. This, this arm is round, so whatever cues I get that the cast shadow from this arm is showing this one as being round, I'm going to make sure and get those described so that I can have as, so it can even further say, wow, look how round this is. The half tone on this arm combined with that cast shadow from the other arm, and you're really starting to show off the roundness, just really starting to show off the nature of that form. Uh, in this case, the forearm with its round, sort of cylindrical uh, idea. All right, now just one other thing since we've got 15 minutes. This was all in vine charcoal, but if I wanted to push this further, I probably would have started doing this sooner. This is a stick of compressed charcoal. This compressed charcoal, as you can see, it'll go much darker, much darker than your vine charcoal. There's a weird moment though, especially where it goes down on where this vine charcoal is quite thick. There's a weird moment where the compressed charcoal is plowing the vine charcoal out of the way and you get this strange haloing that occurs. Right? It's like it's lightened up in some spots through here. This texture is lighter than the vine charcoal was. And it's because this compressed charcoal stick has just plowed the vine out of the way. I just need to either incorporate with my fingers. And this is why I would have done this a little bit earlier. Um, if I need something smooth like a background, I can incorporate with my fingers. Or I can come back with this stick and just, you know, laboriously chase that stuff around if I don't want to do this with my fingers. Um, this is where a blending stick, and I'll get, I'll get one of those just so you know what it looks like. It's not on the materials list, but it's one of these. I was using this on some red stuff earlier, but uh, it's one of these and it'll give you some really tight, control. So if you have this happening somewhere like you need a little softened edge inside of a tight area, these aren't, aren't so bad. They're pretty good for that. Right now I'm just going to take this background a little further. Since I got started, I can't see what I'm doing through my hand, so I'm going to switch. With the vine charcoal down though, it's a really short trip with your fingers to just work that compressed charcoal into smoothness.
right? That's starting to give a lot of space, quite a sense of space. Come in with some core shadow. Right, I've obviously not used my full value potential here because as I put this, this compressed charcoal down, stuff just goes darker and darker. This is why compressed is so nice. Vine can feel sort of thin sometimes. If you get a really soft vine charcoal, it's actually it's quite nice as well. But the compressed charcoal just does a great job of darkening things up and making them a lot richer. All right, so we should be able to identify as we're drawing what we're, so this is harking back to what I talked about before. We should be able to point to that and say, that's my highlight. We should be able to point to this and say, that's my direct light. We should be able to point to that and say, that's my half tone. This core shadow. I'm writing this backwards, by the way. I have it flipped. This is my left hand. So if my handwriting's terrible, that's why. Core shadow here. Reflected light here. We'll go. Core shadow, CRS. Cast shadow. All right, we should be able to label all of those things. And particularly when we're drawing, drawing on the figure, we should be able to, as we're working, say, okay, identify, what is this? What am I looking at on the figure here? Identify the light source. Where is it coming from? Is this light spot that I'm seeing on the model reflected light? Or is it actual light? So where is the light source? Oh, it's over there. So there's no physical way it could be shining on this other side of the figure. So this lighter area I see must be something else. What is it? Oh, there's like a white chair that's bouncing light back in. That's reflected light. I know what to do with the values. Tone them down. All right. Otherwise, you'll be doing stuff like, oh, reflected light. That's light. Right? And it'll just scream off the page and it'll kind of wreck your... You won't have a sensible value structure. And so then you won't have a convincing sense of form in the figure that you're drawing. All right, I'm going to call it there. Uh, 11.23, I'm going to go wash my hands. At 11.30, we will have our open Zoom session. So if you have other questions or you want to show me a drawing in progress or anything like that, uh, go ahead and come to that Zoom session. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow morning at 10, I'll have a figure reference up and we'll be drawing from the figure in the live stream. Um, if I could get maybe a volunteer at the beginning of that meeting as well to be a moderator, I guess, I guess I could make the meeting private. I just don't know if you guys will see it at that point. Anyway, I might make a couple of moderators and then if we get another troll who's like, you're all wasting your time, you can descend upon them and destroy them for me. All right. And then I, I'm recording these. I've started recording these live streams as I do them on my own computer. So I think I'll do some time lapse, maybe sometime uh, break apart different drawing parts of them and do time lapse. Um, at least that's part of my plans at the moment. All right. I'll see you folks in the Zoom session. If I don't see you then, we'll see you tomorrow for the figure drawing full value render um, using white paper, a combination of white paper, charcoal pencil, compressed charcoal, vine charcoal. We'll kind of bring a bunch of our stuff together on that one.